Hello, everyone. You're listening to Truth Cat Radio at truthcatradio.com. Uh, the current time is 8 o'clock p.m. Well, actually, uh, I'm sorry, 8 19 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. That's East Coast USA. Uh, although uh, I myself am broadcasting from Chicago, Illinois, uh, U.S., uh, my name is Richard Carey, and this is Beyond the Matrix. Uh, Jay Dyer um, will be discussing esoteric Hollywood and geopolitics. Uh, shortly, uh, we'll get to our guest and topic. Uh, first, I w- would like to mention that we are listener supported. Uh, we are not accepting any corporate advertising. Uh, we're not monetizing. And the archives are free. So if you can, please support our station. Uh, We have a support page at our station website, a URL, uh, www.truthcatradio.com. PayPal is accepted, and any little bit helps. uh, In the world of independent media, uh, no donation is too small. Uh, So, yeah, anything you can. And please join our uh, TruthCat Facebook group and like our pages uh, for TruthCat Radio and our group TruthCat page Beyond the Matrix. Anyone uh, who might want to call in tonight and have a question for Jay, um, the call-in number will be 714-598-3125. Again, that's 714-598-3125. Please be sure to turn off your radio when you call in. Don't say anything when the call in queue. Um, I'll verbally invite you to speak by your area code. And uh, once again, uh, please uh, help out and support the station whenever you can. Now then, uh, as I said, Jay Dyer is with us tonight. Um, Jay's analysis has grown to become one of the premier film and philosophy sites on the net showcasing the talents of Jay Dyer, whose graduate work focused on the interplay of film, geopolitics, espionage, and psychological warfare. Jay is a public speaker, lecturer, comedian, and author of the popular title, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbolism in Film as well as the host of the Jay's Analysis podcast, Esoteric Hollywood. Jay is also a regular contributor at 21st Century Wire, Soul of the East, and the Espionage History Archive. Broadcasting and broaching subjects as far and wide as satire, metaphysics, film analysis, theology, geopolitics, literature, and history, as well as interviewing numerous prominent figures. Jay has authored hundreds of articles already read by millions in just the past few years. Jay, hello, are you with us? I am, how are you? Oh, I'm I'm good, thanks, thanks for being with us today. Um, yeah, I uh, hope Thank that... You. I hope I hope it wasn't too inconvenient. Uh, what what uh what part of the country are you are you uh in? Southern U.S. Uh, relatively close to Nashville. Okay, all right. Well, um, yeah, I'm sorry we had to start a little late. And, uh, no problem. We had a little issue earlier there, but uh, definitely glad glad to have you have you with us tonight. Um, yeah, I'm glad to well, be here. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't know if there's um any anything um, in particular um, that you'd like to start with. Um, please do. I mean, you know, I had a a, a few uh, subjects um, in mind. Um, well, I don't know. Is there is there a, is there something in particular that you that you've had a uh, on your mind lately that you've been working working on uh, currently? Recently? Uh, well, I usually produce something every day, so there's quite a few things that have been on my mind. Um, did you want to pick something, or <laughs> did you just want me to start talking, or what? Well, I, I know you have, uh, yeah, you have a broadcast where you 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 interview um, various guests as well, uh-huh. right? 
Yes. So, I mean, yeah, I know I'm sure you have a lot of, 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 of topics uh, that, that you're always covering. I, yeah, I, I understand that. Well, I mean, maybe if you could uh, explain just the whole concept of, um, you know, your work with Isoteric Hollywood and, and, and your film analysis work to the, to the listeners, just, just to introduce them to, to how you approach this yeah. sort of thing with your philosophy background. Right. Well, I took a lot of film classes and uh, some, you know, philosophy classes at the same time when I was doing undergrad and graduate work and started to notice a lot of the tie-ins between the way that Hollywood would present things and the way that we see things in mainstream media or perhaps in history. And I noticed that a lot of times what you would see in mainstream media would be more so psychological warfare and that it would actually tie in pretty consistently with the presentations and the narratives in Hollywood films. And I decided I, had, I took a class actually that was really interesting called Hollywood history, where we analyzed w at least what we could make out of historical events and the way that they were presented in various movies since the inception of Hollywood. So that was kind of a springboard at the time that gave me the idea to start doing really in-depth film analysis. And so it's not really like Roger Ebert. It's a little more like if you read Roger Ebert's stuff, he, I think he did a, a degree in English. So you'll get kind of a literary analysis of films at time with Ebert. But what I do is I kind of stack on other levels of interpretation and analysis. So I'll stack on a philosophical analysis maybe a propaganda analysis, maybe geopolitics, maybe something religious or uh, theological, or maybe something mystical and esoteric, just depending on what I think, you know, the film's presenting or dealing with. So I decided in my grad work, I'd focus on one of the best examples of that technique of using fiction as propaganda with uh, Ian Fleming's character, James Bond. So I did a lot of grad work on Bond and Fleming and the Bond novels and then how they were translated over into film and how these different films were used to really change mass opinion. And, and it functions on many levels, everything from product placement and advertising to Cold War fears and hyping up the Cold War and geopolitical targets with regard to uh, – could be many things depending on the bond novel you know some of the novels deal with uh, topics like eugenics some of the novels deal with um, under under market black market uh, operations diamond smuggling and so forth and most of the time i discovered you would find that there was some basis in reality and what fleming was writing about uh, but it was usually uh, spun in a propagandist way using the technique of, say, projection, where what the CIA and MI6 are actually doing, they're projecting onto some fictional villain like Blofeld or something like that. Uh, but then after looking at a lot of Bond films, and I'd already kind of been writing film analysis just as a kind of hobby, I uh, started branching out you know, into writing more philosophical and geopolitical-focused articles and so it just kind of took off from there. And I guess there's around, a, there's over a thousand posts. And I think I've written probably six, 700 articles uh, on all these various topics. But just because of the nature of pop culture, uh, the film analysis tends to be, you know, what drives the majority of the traffic. Uh, it's not, it's not my main interest. I have other interests, but you know, most of the, most people are watching movies. They're not interested in philosophy. They're not interested in, reading books or anything like that, but everybody's going to go see the latest blockbuster. So, you know, that's, like I said, <clears throat> like I said, the majority of what drives the traffic, but I don't, I don't just focus on blockbusters. You know, there's a lot of analyses of classic films. I look at Hitchcock, I look at Kubrick, I look at Spielberg and uh, my book that's now complete. Uh, it's about 400 pages and you get 404 footnotes pretty heavily referenced. Uh, it'll be out in, in a month or two. Uh, and I've got chapters, you know, big, big sections on Kubrick films, uh, Hitchcock films, 007, Spielberg. Um, I look back to the origins of science fiction with H.G. Uh, Wells and Jules Verne and these different characters and how uh, fiction and, pro and propaganda have been really kind of marshaled and co-opted by the social engineers and the you know Pentagon strategists and Rand Corporation and, you know, things that you might see satirized in Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, that's more or less accurate in a way uh, with, uh, you know, how the Rand Corporation, for example, would utilize 
propaganda for hyping up the uh, Cold War, which would then transition into, of course, the war on terror. So all of this is reflected uh, in in Hollywood. You know, all the events that we see in the in so-called reality are reflected in uh, their Hollywood uh, narratives and versions, which I think are there to kind of fill in the gaps. I mean, obviously, Hollywood exists to make money and all that, too. But at a deeper level, all of the coordination that we see with uh, the CIA and the Pentagon with Hollywood, which I think is a, a very high degree, there's a high, high degree of coordination between these entities to, uh, well, for many purposes, but to uh, function as psychological warfare in foreign propaganda because movies are now global. Hollywood is global. Um, movies are put into foreign theaters for propaganda reasons. Um, movies function to socially engineer the U.S. audiences to accept different things, to move them into moral, new moral territory or or, or uh, moral free territory, I guess you could say, uh, with nudging and so forth that Cass Sunstein talks about. So all of these techniques are very real and they're all utilized in modern filmmaking. And actually, they've been in existence since the beginning of the camera with Edison and uh, different uh, entities, the Pentagon, who would you know experiment with the, the usage of camera later on, the, the works workings of the camera later on for uh, war propaganda, war footage, and so forth. And so I think that you know the, really the focus of what I do is is just looking at what's put out there for us to consume and kind of deconstructing it, dissecting it, and saying what is this really about? I mean, oh, this actually serves you know uh, an ulterior purpose than what we think of as harmless entertainment and obviously the same could be said for uh, music music industry or the arts or you know, any, of the, any of the arts really have been weaponized uh, in in their large-scale apparatus or large-scale applications uh, i'm speaking here of things like modern art museum of modern art and the, the big foundation the families behind that or the uh, you know the big music industry companies the, these are all part of the same power structure the same fortune 100 fortune 500 that are really working in tandem. Uh, they all they all work in unison for the most part in the West, and uh, that is to to ultimately to extend the postmodern philosophy of America and uh, Americanism to the rest of the globe um, for a new world order. Hello. I mean, there would surely be well different groups with different agendas uh, as well uh, contributing to this. Uh, I, I mean, I know the uh, politically correct term for the government is a uh, public relations, uh, mm -hmm. but it, but it's uh, essentially a propaganda. Um, so, so, I mean, you would say on one level, there's uh, the nation uh, who's behind this. And then on another level, well, these, these so-called globalists, you know, these, these people who want to push toward, toward a newer society of, a uh, of, of of just a united uh, central stronghold and caste system uh, for their future. Well, I believe that the dominant power structure in the world is the Atlanticist powers, you might call them, that would be the powers of uh, the Atlantic bloc, that would be the U.S., the U.K., and Israel, that, that power structure which is run by kind of shadow banks and shadow corporations shadow foundations and the big families they have the upper hand for most of the globe and they are in the phase of uh, mopping up and wiping out rival and competitive cultures the clash of civilizations and so forth that will lead to this kind of uh, fabian socialist uh, brave new world scenario you know 50 100 years down the road so we're we're in different business phases of moving towards that that final stage uh you know, the, the global elite have outlined in many, many books, many white papers. You know, I, I write about uh, Brzezinski and what he talks about. I write about uh, Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope, what he's written about. You know, all, all these plans are very, very open. It's not secret. Uh, so we know who the culprits are. It's the uh, Western government uh, and their shadow banking empire behind them. So this, this is a, an attempt to condition the the masses gradually basically um yeah it's long long term 
I don't know how, well, it depends on, you know, what scale you view things on, but compared to how some would assume, I mean, it's a relatively long-term plan, um, mm-hmm. more, more for uh, the next generation, ultimately, um, that, that they want to influence. Yeah, I believe each generation has uh, targeted uh, psychological operations for that time period. So you'll notice that suddenly out of nowhere, we've been told now that transgenderism is normal. Uh, this ties into transhumanism because they are both movements that are post-human. And, uh, for example, Quigley talked about this uh, in the second third of the book uh, back in 1966 when he wrote his big apologetic for the Western establishment. And he said that that's what we would expect in the future is um, things like transhumanism, posthumanism, cybernetics, cyborgs, and so forth. So that's that's the rage nowadays. And I think that that's on purpose because you can see from uh, the writings of say Aldous Huxley or from Carol Quigley that those ideas were known a long time ago. You can find this in science fiction writers as well, HG Wells or Isaac Asimov or any of the other multitude of popular science fiction authors. They were saying this would be the future. Uh, Now I believe that was a kind of predictive programming and it was intended to be phased in over time. And so what we're seeing with the millennials and the reason that they're being so heavily propagandized with uh, transgenderism is ultimately to uh, further the philosophy of transhumanism. So I see that as the the phase that we're entering now. Some have called it the age of transition. Uh, I think even some of the global writers have called it that. Uh, you can find writings like that in uh, statements like that in Alvin Toffler, who talked about uh, the age that we'd be entering now. So, yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's it's a, a slow model, but it also I mean, it's not just slow because uh, transgenderism has just suddenly become a new right. Right. It's the new aspect of the civil rights movement, supposedly. And that was just completely foisted upon the entire. It's almost global, you could argue now, especially Western nations for the most part. And they would really like to see all of that uh, toxic monoculture exported globally. So, you know, the goal here is uh, wreck any countries or nations that might uh, not be up to par, not not, not be part of this uh, this long-term business plan. And that's what we're seeing in places like Syria or Ukraine or, or uh, what they would like to see in Russia, uh, places like Iran. These countries represent, uh, it's not that they were perfect or uh, ideal or anything like that, but rather that, uh, you know, they, they, in some way, in terms of the mass population's view or worldview, they don't represent Western um, postmodern liberalism. And I say liberalism in the classical sense of uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment, of uh, liberal markets, uh, of monoculture, uh, of universalized human nature, all these ideas that come out of the Enlightenment, uh, laissez-faire and so forth. These are the classical liberal ideas that pretty much won out at the time of the Cold War. Uh, and so that is the dominant power. That's the mul- that's the unipolar world that we now live in uh, of the the Western so-called liberal values that are being uh, exported to the rest of the globe uh, as a, a weaponized form of uh, cultural chaos and destabilization. I think a lot of people have trouble understanding how how some of these things can be can be weaponized. But I mean, it, mm-hmm. it, it seems it seems like when when you try to have people questioning, you know, things like gender, um, thing, things like um, just just whether or not they want to, you know, become a robot, you know, basically or not, or, or some sort of right, cyborg, right. So, cyborg in between. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose these are ways of um, just just making everyone equal um, and equally controllable, a loss of identity um, as, as a means of control. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And um, so, I mean, a lot of a lot of these these countries you mentioned, I mean, are resisting a, a lot of um, you know mm-hmm. the forces at work there. I mean, I know all, all across Europe, uh, and I, I I fear in the states as well now. I mean, they're starting to implement at very young ages in the schools uh, all of this gender conditioning. It it it, it really is quite extreme from the examples I've I've heard. It of. is. Uh, yeah, that's exactly that proves my point. And you'll notice that it's the Pentagon that promotes this and it's the big foundations that are all 100 percent on board with all this all the big corporations promote it and that shows you that it's a unified social engineering strategic agenda it's not accidental it's not 
something that just organically happened out of nowhere. Rather, all of these sort of new tre- so-called trends uh, are given to us uh, by by these uh, social engineers, by these um, academic so-called elites, which are basically just scumbags in my view. Uh, and you know that they, they really believe their own baloney. They believe their own uh, gospel. They have a, a it's a kind of cult, a kind of religion uh, of of liberalism in the sense of, as I mentioned before, uh, belief in the creation of some form of utopia. Now, most liberals so-called would not be utopians in like a classical Marxist sense or something like that. But I think that, Technology is perceived to be um, kind of a, a new idol. You know, it's man's new new idol, and, and and it gives the impression that it will be the means by which the transcending of all health ills and mortality, right, and, and so forth, get that this can all be remedied through uh, some form of uh, technological salve in some way. But, uh, you know, that's all predicated on a certain view of anthropology and that dominant view of, of man that they've, that they've had for the last, uh, you know, 150 or so years is uh, the sort of the social Darwinian perspective that, that man is just kind of an evolving, uh, mass of goo. And, uh, if man is just merely, you know, a collection of atoms and, and goo, then he can uh, be environmentally tweaked and uh, perhaps, quote, perfected, right? This is the the older alchemical idea of the great work and so forth, the perfecting of nature through man's artifice and technology. And I, I don't believe that any of that's true. I think this is all based on a lot of uh, faulty presuppositions that come out of the Enlightenment, the idea that, you know, that the Western Anglo-Saxon uh, liberal tradition is the uh, only tradition in the world that it's the most superior tradition that all other forms of government or social order or philosophy are are somehow inferior and because this one is pragmatic and it applies its methods of uh, deceit and trickery uh, as we saw for example with the whole history of the British Empire uh, that it's somehow superior pr- pr- just simply because of some will to power uh, I don't believe that that's the case I believe that's a very short-sighted and uh, uh, ridiculous view, you know, philosophically or historically speaking. So I believe that um, the main downfall of our, our existing power structure and social engineers and so forth uh, is precisely their uh, bad anthropology, their their view of man uh, being so short-sighted. Uh, and you'll find a lot of these contradictions in the very thinkers who dreamt up this nightmare uh, dystopia, which we're entering into. For example, you'll see uh, Bertrand Russell, the, you know, the committed atheist, uh, Fabian depopulation proponent. Uh, Russell will sit there and say that uh, on the one hand, he's a committed atheist and, and souls and free will and all this. Thing, this doesn't exist. And then he'll turn around and say that the spirit of man and man's free will will have to be stamped out in the coming uh, world order. Now, why would you have to stamp something out that didn't exist? Right. So I think that they I'm speaking of these uh, academic and uh, power elite. I don't think that they uh, many of them, I think, know deep down that that they foist a giant deception on everybody. Uh, but that's part of, I guess, the bargain. That's kind of the, um, you know, the, the to uh, to be in the power structure, to be at that level requires, you know, the acceptance of a, a giant lie. Uh, and that is, I think, their so-called gospel, right? It would be this whole, this whole notion of uh, the, the ability of man to uh, erect a, uh, a humanistic, uh, quote-unquote, uh, liberal social order. Uh, and then uh, the irony, of course, is that the people who dreamt up all of that UN Charter, Enlightenment, liberal nonsense, don't believe that themselves. You know, they're they're very committed, culture of death proponents. Uh, you know, who who would like to see most people dead, uh, and you know, that's, it really just goes back to that social Darwinism aspect of, uh, the outworkings, uh, I believe of a lot of, uh, bad philosophy in the West that led to this kind of, um, low base materialistic pragmatist philosophy, uh, that is, uh, very closely connected to uh, Freemasonry and its philosophy that pretty much dominates the West and, you know, seeks to, 
to stamp out uh, the future of mankind and, and other cultures. That's what's interesting about this is that under the guise of so-called liberalism and tolerance and the human rights philosophy and the idea of, quote, free markets and all this nonsense, uh, when they seek to export this to other countries and other nations or rival cultures, it requires the destruction of those cultures. And so the great irony, the great contradiction of uh, Western liberalism is that it cannot tolerate anything else. Uh, and so therefore it is the preeminent intolerant position. Yeah, that seems uh, similar to United States philosophy um, when interacting with, yeah. with other countries. You know, it's like the self-appointed uh, policeman, um, you yeah. know, who, who can't stand any competition, basically. Uh, you've, you've, you've talked to, uh, uh, I mean, well, in a lot of your articles, um, you've been analyzed a lot, a lot of psyops. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I read an interesting one on, uh, Jade Helm, for example, of, you know, oh, is it, yeah. I mean, I, I, I found that pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you'd like to, to go, to go into. Well, the this, yeah, sure. I mean, this was kind of hyped up in alternative media, uh, you know, in this kind of, uh, Patriot tard type groups and Patriot radio that uh, is always talking about being put in a FEMA camp or a gulag or something like this. And uh, the first thing that is ridiculous about that is that if you look at how many times they, uh, this uh, so-called Patriot media has been wrong and for how many decades they've been talking about being put in a FEMA camp and all this nonsense, uh, most of that is just a bunch of con men in my view. And I don't really pay much attention to it. And if you look at uh, the history of drills military, FEMA, whoever, they're always running drills. There's drills running 24-7, <laughs> somewhere in the country at least, and oftentimes, you know, large portions of the country, uh, and then, of course, globally. So the fact that idiots in the alternative media latch onto some drill and then hype it up, I mean, it's just really it's nonsense. It's meaninglessness. I don't pay much attention to it, but uh, Jade Helm was relevant because it was such a big deal. And, uh, you know, we, we were told that there was this leaked document about uh, what the drills were going to be. Well, anytime something like that happens, uh, it's leaked on purpose. I mean, that's common sense. If you've spent much time studying the government or espionage, uh, you don't have uh, accidental leaks happening all the time. Most of the time, I'm not saying there can't be a real whistleblower, but I'm saying that most of the time these kinds of leaks, be it, be it WikiLeaks or whatever, uh, they're intentional and targeted leaks. And so I think that uh, Jade Helm is a great example of uh, maybe a deeper level uh, kind of psychological operation to see what the reactions are. And so we know that the the military and cybercom and so forth are very interested in gauging the reactions of uh, mass groups. And this can be done uh, through advanced computing online and through simulant world systems and so forth. And so that's, I think, a much better uh, way to understand Jade Helm uh, than to take it in some sort of, you know, patriot militia radio thing that you're going to be put into a gulag. Because as I always point out, you're you're already in a gulag. Uh, the American simulacra is a gulag. Dis we're in our, we're in a Disney gulag, right? The the establishment doesn't they don't have to enact some global currency after some great crisis. There's already a global currency. It was set up at Bretton Woods. It's the dollar is the world reserve currency. So there's already a, a world order. There's already a global currency. They might change that down the road, you know, into some IMF global thing or whatever. Uh, but uh, I don't, you know, the, the, the panic and the, the, um, all the fear-based stuff and all that is not really how things work because, you know, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, uh, the, the, the establishment, the system is much more interested in uh, this, the slow kill methods of, you know, the food and the water and the GMOs and the weaponized culture and, and all of that. That's a lot more effective than some top down iron fisted, you know, thugs uh, stomping through your neighborhood and, and loading you into a, a van and a train cart taking you to a FEMA camp or something like that. Now, I mean, that, that could happen. Sure. But. Uh, it's much more likely that the establishment would uh, just much rather kind of sit back and um, and uh, surveil everyone uh, and create profiles and manipulate through <coughs> through uh, 
you know, through uh, the NSA style stuff. So I don't think they need gulags or, uh, uh, you know, these kinds of things when we already have that with the existing, we're, we live in a Hollywood gulag. So wh- why would you need gulag? Right. I mean, the, the current um, economic system, mm-hmm. financial system, it's, it's, it's an indentured servitude that can just keep pressing down tighter. And exactly. With the amount of propaganda they have, um, you know, to at their disposal combined with that. I mean, why would they want to, to change the status quo too much? Yeah. And I mean, there, a lot of money is being made in the meantime, look at the 2008 bailouts. That was a giant swindle. So why cook the goose, right? That keeps laying the golden eggs. And uh, if you look at history, the, this is kind of how the establishment, and I believe it's pretty much the same families that are still in power all the way. We can go back to like the depression and, and FDR, and you know, FDR presented himself as this great man of the people. Uh, but if you read Quigley's uh, analysis of FDR, he talks about how, well, so you had all these uh, Wall Street uh, hooligans and swindlers that basically crashed the stock market, and then FDR comes along and says, uh, oh, I'll save you with a bunch of uh, socialism and collectivism. And where does he get the money for all the public works projects? Well, Quigley says he got it from all the same bankers uh, behind the crash. So what did he do? Well, he just put the next generation in debt to the bankers. And then after a period of collectivism and everybody getting sick of collectivism, then the next generation gets a phase of privatization, right? And so this pendulum swing back and forth is just another manipulated dialectic. Uh, John Perkins outlines this uh, in terms of foreign policy in other countries where they just do the exact same thing. Maybe uh, one country could uh, benefit the bankers through collectivization and socialism. Uh, and maybe another country could benefit the bankers through deregulation and privatization. So it just depends on uh, what the needs of the hour are for the bankers uh, and the swindlers. And that's what they do. So it's a been a rigged game. In fact, Quigley says you can go back to 1900 and the big families uh, in 1900 owned over half of the country's assets. So if you own over half the country's assets, that pretty much gives you control of the country, I would say. So, you know, we have this mythology of, uh, oh, 1913, the Federal Reserve was, uh, you know, sneakily passed in through Congress on Christmas night. Or, well, I don't think that that's that big of a deal. Or, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it didn't happen or that the uh, Jekyll Island meetings didn't happen. But what I'm saying is that the families already had the controlling interest in the country in the year 1900. So, according to, uh, you know, Carol Quigley, who's writing his apologetic from the CFR archives. So, you know, a lot of these uh, sort of conspiracy realm, alternative media mythologies, I think, ought to be debunked. And the sooner that they're debunked, and that would include things like Jade Helm and that we're all going to be trucked away to FEMA camps, uh, you know, the, the better I think we are at understanding the world around us and, and, and acting appropriately as a result. Yes, um, you. I know you've um, dissected uh, a number of false flags um, as well. Um, I, I find it interesting mm-hmm. um, the detail you go into with the, the well, the sort of um, key factors or, or telltale um, clues to look for uh, mm-hmm. if, if if there's like fraud, fraudulent um, witnesses, uh, crisis actors on camera interviews. Um, Absolutely, yeah. That sort of thing. I don't know if you could maybe go into a little uh, uh, explanation of, of that for, for right. Well, I think that um, looking into Hollywood and the history of camera and media and all that was actually very beneficial for uh, understanding these so-called large-scale terror events because I think that they're really very similar to scripted Hollywood things, and you, you'll see that if you watch say a lot of espionage movies or movies that deal with terrorism or something like that, you'll start to notice that the way that the news tells these so-called stories is very, very much like the way it's presented in movies. And you'll even find that the, um, the, the mass media news presentations are unfortunately most of the time like B movies, they're really bad versions of things. And I think that if you, uh, Looking at the fakery angle of it, I think was a big uh, key, you know, to try to 
get a better handle on uh, understanding these kinds of events because uh, you start to understand that intelligence agencies are very adept at using deception and using trickery. That's what they've done for many, many, many millennia even. Uh, and you can go all the way back to ancient accounts of warfare. You know, deception is one of the key aspects of uh, warfare and psychological warfare. You know, war warfare is ultimately won through the mind most of the time, not through battle per se. Uh, so when we look at these uh, large scale so-called terror events, the first thing that we have to, I think, consider is the source. And who are the sources for all of these events? Well, it's usually a handful of so-called organizations. Uh, the site intelligence network will give us the uh, what we're supposed to believe are ISIS videos. Uh, we'll get uh, information from unnamed sources, quote unquote, for, from CNN or Fox. Well, who are, who is this? Right. This this is a lot of times is just made up, I believe. Uh, and I think a lot of the terror events uh, are made up whole cloth by the media and by the intelligence agencies working in tandem. And they've done that for many years, all the way back to the beginning of mass media with uh, uh, CBS. And it's being founded by uh, all the people from the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, William Paley and Sarnoff and so forth. So the, the whole history of mass media is uh, directly tied to intelligence networks and psychological operations. That's the whole point of the TV. So, uh, you know, I think you need to look no further than that to start to doubt the source, right? And I'm speaking of the the mass media um, outlets themselves as the sources. And then when it comes to the terror events, the, uh, the information is fed to the media from entities like the CIA or the FBI. Uh, and the FBI, of course, will shut down anything that is, quote, national security, and you've had many FBI and uh, documentaries and interviews uh, that talk about how this is largely theatrics. And it's theatrics on one level because it backs up the funding, right? If your local uh, uh, bureau of investigator or whatever, first responders, if they make some giant terror bust, quote unquote, uh, then that, of course, justifies the uh, public paying them millions and billions of dollars, supposedly. So on the one hand, it's just a marketing money game. Uh, on the other level, it's uh, propaganda. It's uh, you know foreign foreign policy nonsense. With uh, oh, we need to go after ISIS because ISIS and Al Qaeda have hit you know the Bataclan theater in Paris and the Charlie Hebdo and all this. And, and and you look into these actual events, and there's no way to substantiate what's actually going on here, right? We're always given these uh, grainy. Uh, 10 year old quality uh, cell phone footage of about 10 seconds of nothing. And this is supposed to justify the entire media's narrative of what happened in this so called event. And so, you know, we just, we, we there's no way to verify this. There's no way to, uh, you know, verify who actually died in these events, get any coroner's reports because they're all classified under national security or whatever, or, you know, French national security or whatever. Uh, so this is just a, an arena that's then rife for or excuse me, ripe uh, for deception and trickery. And we know that these entities engage in deception and trickery all the time. I mean, CNN, how many times have they been caught just whole cloth making up fake news all the way back to the Gulf War, Charles Jaco footage that everybody's probably seen on YouTube of just completely fake green screen war footage. Uh, and I mean, this should completely ruin them and their reputation as a news source. I mean, they, they should be completely just disgraced and, not believed after that. But of course, that's not how you know, humans operate. They go right back to their, <laughs> to their abuser, like some sort of a abusive, uh, you know, relationship or something anyway. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at that, then you look at who we're supposed to believe are the villains in these so-called terror events. And it's always ISIS and Al Qaeda, which are openly known to be entities created by Western intelligence, you know, 1978, 79 Gates and Brzezinski and, uh, Pakistani ISI and British intelligence. And then you go back to the history of the Muslim Brotherhood and um, you know, the creation of uh, Wahhabism and its co-opting by British intelligence, you know, 100, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, whatever. So, you know, all of this is just uh, uh, nonsense. It's just made up. It's a, it's a complete marketing gimmick. 
Uh, ISIS is not an actual state. It's not a, a entity that exists in some actual country somewhere. It's this uh, sh- quote shadowy uh, terrorist organization, and it keeps changing its name. And it has fictional characters, Al Baghdadi, who are the leader. Uh, and this is all just made up by the military and the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies working in tandem with uh, you know their NATO affiliates and the Gulf uh, Gulf states and all their BFFs. So, you know, once you understand that um, a lot a lot of this is just theatrics and, uh, you know, play acting, how many times, I mean, we and this just came out, like within the last week, right? It was just admitted that the Pentagon paid Bell Pottinger, the PR firm, uh, $540 million to create uh, fake terror videos. So I mean, we, we've been covering that, myself and 21st Century Wire, for the last three or four years, you know, in countless articles, countless interviews. So that just confirms, you know, one more piece of evidence confirming, you know, obviously we're correct. It's not that hard to figure it out. So uh, most of the time, I, I mean, I can't say in every case, I think that obviously there are some uh, real events that, that go down. I think uh, Syria, Aleppo, you know, th- this is a place that's uh, under under attack from uh, mercenaries. Uh, they're not actual uh there's not some vast uh, global terror network. It's just basically intelligence agencies that hire in the military that hires these, uh, you know, these these proxy jihadis, Al Nusra's and, and uh, Al Nusra's moderate rebels, which are not moderate rebels. They're all just part of the same uh, created dialectic, and this is to remove Assad. So that's one example. That's real. Aleppo is really uh, being bombed, and you have all these people that are being forcibly. A displaced uh, population migrations, which are a form of wepa- weapon, weaponized warfare as well. Kelly Greenhill, the professor, has written about this weaponized migration. So it serves a double, double-edged sword. You can move giant um, populations into Europe to displace the existing population, as well as uh, wrecking uh, Assad and Syria. Uh, you know, so it, it's a, it's a dirty game, but it definitely serves the uh, globalist interests in that case. And then all of these shooting incidents in the U.S., I mean, I I can't believe how much, I mean, I've been following the independent media for, for mm-hmm. years now, you know, and I can't believe how much it's accelerated, the frequency of these events and the amount that they, as I think you've described as well, just the amount they have everything all ready to go with the way they're going to react uh, mm-hmm. to it and mm-hmm. just, just uh, the, the, you know, these sudden um claims of of knowing who the perpetrator is and them exactly. having story already for you and it's just no, really no trial no trial it's trial by media right and there's just, just no no uh no sense to it. i think uh, there was um uh, i can't remember the name of it but there was some uh i think it was a jimmy stewart movie film that um was related to uh depictions of the of the fbi and um i believe j edgar hoover was obsessed with uh, just how the FBI were depicted in this film, you know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's called the FBI story. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and I, I, I think it's just the first step for a lot of people out there. It's just, um, you know, to realize just, just how much propaganda is used, um, you know, just as a matter of course by the government, and and how they will lie to you, and that they will actually stay, you know, have these events, um, you know. Yes, at times people get shot and at times people don't. I mean, like, well, from the evidence we have of Sandy Hook, um, no one, I mean, you know, the school didn't actually exist, you know, but now they're they're threatening uh, Wolfgang Halbig um, <laughs> because he, he he was getting too close, you know, with all of his information. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people may actually die at times. So people, uh, I know some are confused about what a false flag means, but just for them to understand that it's it's you know trying to present it as something other than what it really was which was more planned um for the reaction from mm-hmm. the public exactly um, yeah than, than than most most people realize i mean i i believe a um robert uh steel he he mm-hmm. made a, an assertion that all all of these events uh, are are false flags um, from what he gathers. I mean, you know, every single one of them. And I, I from from what I've seen of people dissecting them, uh, once you know what to look for and you're able to believe that the government will do this easily, it it it, it gets a bit easier um, for for yeah. you to start taking this in. Absolutely, yeah. I think 
most of the time when the mass media, the entire mass media focuses on the event, you can be suspicious. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why they don't talk about, uh, you know, what's happening in Syria, except when they try to paint it as the, that, uh, Russia and Assad are, uh, bombing the, the good guys, which of course is not true. And we've seen that with, uh, propaganda pieces like the Syrian dust boy and the white helmets, uh, which we've covered uh, many times as well. And so, but that ties into the, the terror, the false flags, because, uh, you know, the governments, the governments have a long history of false flags, and I'm sure the audience is probably aware of that. I'm not going to bore anybody with the history of false flags, but I mean, yes, it's not very hard to figure that one out. And then once you figure that one out, you start to say, well, I made it. Wait a minute. How how would be the easiest way that they might conduct this? Uh, you know, are they, are they really going to send uh, mind control assassins into do, do this stuff? Why would you do that when there's, there's so much uh, room for contingency there? Why would you do that when you can use the media and the mockingbird media and the, all the Hollywood techniques and, and tricks that you know and the hyper realistic training that the military uses to simply stage the event? And all you need is a few people who are in the know, uh, and then all of the idiot population goes along with it, and all the people who participate in the drills, you know, they don't know what's going on. But you have key people, key moles in the positions, perhaps private contractors uh, who know what's actually going on. And so it would uh, conceivably be very easy to fake. For, furthermore, who is even going to conceive of it as being faked? So, it's, I mean, even if uh, somebody started catching on, nobody's going to believe them. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, that, I think it's a much more rational and sensible uh, understanding of terror and the terror narrative that we're given than most of what we see in uh, even the alternative media or perhaps the, or mainstream, mainstream media as well because they, they're – like the most ridiculous conspiracy theorists, especially on things like 9-11. So, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that it's uh, in, intended to achieve uh, emotional reaction on the part of the audience. And the body counts just, oh, they just magically get higher and higher and higher. You know, one guy can go in and take out 50 people, and which is, like, not really possible, you know, from a tactical standpoint. It's, it's not, it's not, it's very difficult to get uh, 50, you know, headshots within a minute, you know, like this is, Arnold Schwarzenegger in commando or something. That's not reality. You know, the great decorated war heroes are lucky to get, you know, 50 or a hundred uh, kills in a, you know, in a battle. So, I mean, it's ridiculous to think that you, that you just uh, walk into a club and just spray the whole place with uh, some sort of uh, assault rifle or whatever. No, that's all nonsense. And so then when you look into the actual People involved in this, oh, you know, Omar Mateen at Orlando just happens to be a crisis actor. His company uh, contracts with Crisis Cast. That's all real. That's all public. They sign non-disclosure agreements. Oh, he just happens to pop up in this uh, giant so-called shooting. I mean, it's very, very uh, highly suspicious, uh, I would say. And uh, when you look at terror from that aspect, it starts to make a lot more sense. And and why is it always the same? Why, why are the patterns always the exact same? I mean, presumably... If the uh, terror cells were real, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't always necessarily see the exact same patterns of the drill, the patterns of the first responders saying exactly what they need to say, knowing right away who it was. I mean, the closed loop of the FBI feeding the media, the foreign policy objective of how, it, oh, it just happens to back up everything that the neoconservatives want in foreign policy. I mean, it's, it's really transparent and obvious after a while. Uh, doesn't mean that we necessarily know exactly what happened in every event and every detail. I don't think we have to. I mean, even a detective doesn't know every every single aspect before he can form a reasonable high, hypothesis of you know who committed a murder or whatever. So in the same way, we don't need to know everything about uh, every single terror event to figure out what happened because, for one, the establishment's already told us many times how they do terror, how they do these events, how they do psychological operations. In many of their books and white papers, you look at Operation Northwoods. What does it talk about? It talks about using fake news. They talk about staging a, a, a plane, a Castro downing a plane with uh, dead bodies that are just from the morgue. And then they would have people uh, uh, ready, to, ready to go to go on the newscast uh, actors. That's what North, uh, Northwoods talks about. Uh, to spin the narrative. Oh, Castro did this or whatever. And I'm not saying Castro is like real opposition or anything. I'm just saying that's one example of uh, everybody's heard of uh, Northwoods or 
perhaps uh, Colonel Fletcher Prouty's book, Secret Team. Well, he talks about the CIA using stagecraft. So that's a big, 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 I think, puzzle piece to understanding how this stuff really goes down. Uh, and it's a much better explanation than mind-controlled assassins or any of this kind of uh, sort of pop Hollywood Jason Bourne nonsense. And we, yeah, we just have, have so many um, yeah, pieces that don't, don't add up um, and that don't fit whenever a lot of these events get dissected. Uh, one agenda, at least for the incidents in the U.S., seems to be the gun laws, um, you know, to reduce or yeah. ultimately remove. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you would agree with that assessment as the primary motive for, for these U.S. shootings? Um, I think that... The, that would be one motive. I don't know that. I mean, I don't think they can reasonably ban all the guns in any time soon. Uh, but like you said, with future generations, I think that they would probably like to instill in the psyche of the millennials and younger, the, the idea of guns equaling mass shooting. And so probably 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, absolutely. They would like to uh, work towards a total gun ban. There's no question. I mean, they've said it many, many times. Uh, Diane Feinstein, right? She's talked about this. Uh, Eric Holder's talked about it, brainwashing people. But I think they're also aware of what they can and can't. Hil Hillary has said this many times. I think they're also aware of what they can and can't realistically do at this time period. So, I mean, they're not going to be able to go door to door and collect everybody's guns. That would take uh, 20 years. And, you know, they don't have the resources to. I mean, there's like what, 200 million guns or something in the U.S. or some some crazy number. You can never get all those. But I think that what they need to do is, rather than trying to get everybody's guns right now, is instill into people's psyche down the road the idea, and especially the youth and brainwashing the youth uh, and younger gener and future generations uh, towards, towards that direction, absolutely. They are getting very regular with, with these terrorist drills at the schools and... Mm -hmm. and and, and, and they're getting the, just a stronger and stronger police presence that really seems unnecessary for just what you would traditionally require at, at, at a school. Right. Yeah, that's why it serves multiple functions. It allows these bureaucracies to become bloated and hire all these people to just sit around and do nothing and, you know, uh, be uh, Homeland Security uh, watchdogs or, or fusion center, whatever, just to basically sit there and watch stuff. And harass people and, and go into comment sections and play on the internet all day. I mean, it's, it's so, yeah, it's a, gives the uh, existing establishment the ability to say they've created a whole bunch of new jobs and that there's this uh, new, this giant security economy of billions of dollars, uh, most of which is, uh, you know, just built on a lie. Yeah, so that the, just the, because the, bu the bureaucracy is the, is the only thing um, left to create jobs. I mean, if, since we all, have, all our manufacturing yes, has been exactly. offshored. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I can't, you mentioned earlier, though, the manipulations even to the environment. I, I really can't believe how reckless just they can be with the genetic engineering and how introducing these new species uh, mm -hmm. and, and hybrid species. And, and, and I, I mean, I just heard recently that, that now bees, uh, a certain type of bee is, is in danger potentially uh, because of, you know, I mean, there's just a domino effect, of course, whenever you, you, you do anything to an ecosystem uh, and, and then that keeps, keeps going. Um, I, I don't know. It just seems very arrogant, you know, just people who, who don't care about the future. Yeah, well, that stems from that scientific worldview that we were talking about earlier, this idea that, uh, you know, the world is just basically unguided and, and in flux and in chaos and that, that the role of man is to kind of be the technological magus, right? And this would, comes out of uh, Francis Bacon and the Enlightenment and the Rosicrucian ideas and so forth that were so popular at that time. And we still kind of live in the lingering aspects of that. Uh, enlightenment philosophy that that man can uh, perfect nature that he can alter it and you know mix species and so forth and basically do it's it's basically just putty you know in the hands of the mad scientist uh, but i think that all ultimately that that always backfires uh, and i think that people that are anti nature and that is the ultimately the scientific worldview and uh, the, the ideology of these 
people who are part of this culture of death is that they're they end up being um, self-effacing you know that they're they're against themselves because they themselves are human and as much as they would like to believe themselves to be gods or semi-god or semi-divine they're very mortal and very human like the rest of us uh, and so that's of course the delusion that they bought into and so you know, the, the actions of being anti-nature and I, I would say that genetic modification is a, a, an aspect of that you know the idea that you can do whatever you want to the biosphere you can pollute it you can uh, geoengineer you can genetically modify whatever uh, that this is all somehow uh you know going to happen without repercussions and that's the way that they view things right because i mean they're atheists or they're luciferians or they're masons or whatever they don't believe in any kind of afterlife necessarily or uh punishments per se or uh that that uh, there's um, a, a debt to be paid for these kinds of things but i think that there is and i think that uh people realize that perhaps as they get older um as they get closer to the grave uh, may, sometimes they don't, but, uh, but yeah, that's the consequence I would say of, uh, a fallen world is the idea that, you know, that, that man can somehow achieve his own uh, redemption or salvation or, um, you know, whatever terms you want to use to, to fix his plight that he's in. And so uh, to me, I, I think it's, it's ultimately kind of Luciferian. It's this whole idea of, you know, Prometheus that, that man can steal the fire of the gods and be his own become his own god uh and that i don't think works out well for men in the long run so anyway i'm kind of rambling but no yeah so but i mean but i mean if you're talking the effacing I, of nature i would say that that that's um it's ultimately only going to harm man himself because man is part of the biosphere he's part of nature and well, that sort of um, well distraction is perhaps um, just a way of not, you know, dealing with the potential consequences um, that you could have, you know, to your immediate surroundings or the or the planet as a whole. Um, I, you've 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 talked a lot about uh, cults, um, you know, the influence even in in the uh, you know the the media and entertainment we consume. Um, but I mean, yeah, a lot of these cults um, are probably a good example of how, you know, you wouldn't really be thinking about the people that you've helped to have killed uh, somewhere, um, you know, for your financial or, or status gain or or perhaps, you know, how you've tampered with, you know, the environment, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and spread harm. I mean, just the status and, and the, uh, you know, um, self um, improving aspect you, you speak of i mean these cults do offer a lot of of that very thing is is, is what i'm getting at the, the cults offer what now well the way the way they entice you know their their par participants a lot of times um you know these cults or or these groups you know you mentioned groups like the masons uh -huh. um you know just just incentives you know for for people right that that can you know distract them at the same time from you know any consequences they they otherwise may have had second thoughts about yeah i would say you know that's always kind of been i guess the temptation of man is to uh, think that hedonism can um satisfy his uh longings his desires uh and you know hedonism ultimately leaves us empty i would say it doesn't it's it's may satiate a person for a time period but uh you know the the brandishments of this world uh, are fleeting so i don't think they uh they ultimately fulfill us uh, but uh, you're absolutely right that the you know the power elite uh and uh, their various networks and you know cults and and uh, secret societies and intelligence networks you know th these are all kind of networks that kind of feed into that same uh, power structure and uh Yes, that is definitely uh, one of the means by which they they uh, buy off and co-opt people and blackmail them and so forth. And um, you can see this in um, movies. Even you watch uh, The Godfather. If you watch Godfather Two, you notice how the Corleone family uh, compromises the uh, politician. You know, they they need the politician to sign some law or bill or something so that the Corleones can purchase the 
uh, rising casinos at that time. And uh, the senator doesn't want to do it. And so they just wait until the uh, senator goes into one of the Corleone uh, whorehouses and then they, you know, frame him basically. Uh, and he, they, they secure the vote. Uh, so, you know, th- this is a, a real aspect of <laughs> uh, shadow politics, you know, using sexual blackmail and so forth. And I think that a, a lot of what we've seen with these stories that have come out about uh, elite government pedophilia and all this kind of stuff, a lot of that has to do with blackmail. And I think the uh, intelligence agencies participate in that blackmail. They'll work with the madams uh, to you know get the compromising data. Uh, you see this even in the movie uh, Bank Job by Guy Ritchie, which is roughly based on a, a supposedly a real heist. And uh, in that movie, the madams are they have taken photographs of a lot of the leading British politicians, uh, and these are used to compromise and blackmail them. So that's a big part of how the uh, control structure controls people. And so when you're talking about offering people uh, enticements, you know, the, the, these kinds of things, these orgies, these parties, these eyes wide shut type st- style things, uh, these are the means by which, you know, the, the power elite can blackmail one another. And uh, I think that, you know, that really does happen. And that's how you can, one way to ensure that people go along with the agenda. All right. Well, uh, maybe this would be a good point to take a five minute break uh, just so that, you know, we could take a take a rest and, uh, you know, okay. do a little station ID. If, if you want to just mute um, for five minutes there. No. OK. OK. Well, uh, everyone, uh, you are uh, listening to Truth Cat Radio. Um, we're speaking today with Jay Dyer. And um, it's been a very interesting conversation. Um, I hope um, you are tuning in and are going to stick around uh, after our hour is up here. Uh, we're going to have Mystic Freedom with Dave Robbins coming on after my show. So please stick around for, for Dave. Um this is Beyond the Matrix. Uh, I'm your host, Richard Carey, at truthcatradio.com. If anyone does want to call in during the second uh, the second half, uh, the call-in number is 714-598-3125. At 714-598-3125. Please be sure to turn off your radio when you call in. Um, if you do want to ask any questions, uh, feel free to give us a call. Um, and uh, once again, I'd like to mention we're listener supported. Uh, we are not accepting any corporate advertising. We're not monetizing. Uh, <laughs> Gee, Richard, I completely blew off your break, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, we started late. Because we so. started late. Yeah, it looks like we, we started like 19 minutes late. Right, like. so so I figured right now I would give our guest a a, a breather and a. <laughs> I, was, I was looking at the clock and I says, okay, let me see. It's uh, it's not even half hour. And I go, oh my god, it's the whole show's over in half an hour. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right, carry on. Okay. Oh, well, I, yes. Well, we are listener supported. Uh, we're not accepting corporate advertising and we're not monetizing. Uh, the archives are free, so if you can, please support our station. We have a support page on the station website. PayPal is accepted, and anything you could spare uh, would help to keep things going here. Please, no donation is too small if, if you could help out. Um, as I said, Dave Robbins is going to be coming on, and that will be uh, just after this hour, which is 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's Dave Robbins with Mystic Freedom. Uh, be sure to stick around for his show. Um, let's see. Well, tomorrow, of course, we have uh, Mind Matters, which starts at 6 p.m. with Ahmad and Ani. And then we have Daryl Nichols at 8 p.m., the Daryl Nichols show, and Madison Star Moon at 10 p.m. And then Wednesday, 6 p.m., Aurelia Light-Helis 
Lady of Light with Aurelia Light Helis. And then at 8 p.m., Trevor Labant with Info Front. Of course, then Thursday, Thursday, 6 p.m., is Graham Sutherland with Delete the Beast. And then we have at 10 p.m., the Stephen D. Kelly Show. And at 12 a.m., Spirit Quest with Tony Pazek. And then, of course, Love Vibrations is on Friday night at 10 p.m. That's Eric Dodmer's Love Vibrations. So uh, yeah, please tune in uh, throughout the week to uh, the rest of the uh, hosts and their shows. I, I, I know uh, we're all looking forward to Dave's show tonight. Mystic Freedom with Dave Robbins. As I said, he'll be starting at 10 p.m. And uh, as I uh, have uh, mentioned already, um, we do accept PayPal on our website at www.truthcatradio.com. If there is um, anything that you could spare to help out, you can go to our support page and, and easily... Uh, help via PayPal. We'd appreciate it uh, just to help help keep things going here for, for all of the programming and news information, guests, and topics we try to bring to all of you and, and hope to keep providing and expanding with the operation. Okay, well, uh, I don't know, I guess that's it's been just about Five minutes or so. Uh, hello, Jay. Uh, are you are you available? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, um, I, uh, I'm trying to think uh, where you left off. Phil. You were um, talking about uh, a lot of the just different influences. Uh, we were bringing up cults and um, just a lot of yeah, just societies and the kind of the kind of um well self-serving and uh i suppose short-term um gratification and self-serving gratification that mm -hmm. and and um you know and enticements and motives uh, that, that 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 can lead people to, in positions of power and 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 influence by these societies to to mm -hmm. do the things that they'll do for for each other and and for promotion, basically. Right. Is that a question or? <laughs> well, I I I I know um you 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 uh, I don't know we're expanding more on that um, before the break um so I don't know if well, there's if more you want to add. Uh, well, we were talking about blackmail and how that's an aspect of uh, you know how the system controls people and uh, make sure that they're in line, obviously money i mean this is you know this is kind of common sense stuff about how the world really works but i guess a lot of people don't know that i was having a conversation today with somebody who uh you know had, i guess had never thought about this aspect of how the world operates and we were talking about the u.s government and so forth and i was saying well you know the best way to understand the government is the mafia model and to understand that as even other gangsters have said like whitey bulger it's the government that's the big mafia they're the real mafia and you, when you understand that, and you understand that, you know the the CIA and the, the government, run, the Pentagon, the soldiers, you know they are part and parcel of the, the drug trade, uh, which is a giant global market, and the arms trade. All right, that where we are told as we're growing up that you know, there's all these rogue drug dealers and rogue networks out there, but that's not really the way it works. You know the the, the reality is that the the major networks are controlled uh, by the Western establishment. And there have been many books on this. Alfred McCloy has a big book, uh, CIA, Politics of Heroin, the History of CIA and the Drug Trade, which details a lot of this uh, in depth. Many other books have been written on that. And, uh, you know, the, when you understand that the history of intelligence agencies is also tied into uh, Golden Crescent, you know, these, these different drug pipelines and drug networks, then you start to understand that the black markets, are, which are a big part of the economy, actually, 
and the fact that all the, the giant banks, Wells Fargo, Wachovia, are tied into the, the uh, drug money laundering, which has even been in mainstream news in the past three or four years, you start to see that, you know, we're not actually run by this, what we think of as a state, we're, we're run by this more of a cartel, more of a a, a mafia style situation. And uh, obviously it's not the Italian mafia that runs everything, but if you watch the movie, The Godfather, in all three parts, it really shows you, you know, how this, how this system works. Uh, and, you know, they even, the Corleones even bring that up many times in the, in the film that it's, you know, the government's just kind of a rival mafia. And so at least the Italian mobsters in the film, at least they had some concern for their people, right? I mean, you, I think we could give them props for that, give them some, some credit for at least having a concern for, uh, you know, not, for example, Don Corleone doesn't want to partake in, uh, importing uh, drugs into for the uh, you know the Italian neighborhoods because he says he knows it'll ruin their neighborhoods like it did the blacks. Uh, and so the other Dons, what do they do? Well, they take Don Corleone out for that, if you remember the plot of, uh, of the trilogy. And I think that that's very telling uh, in, in terms of you know how the, the world really works, that it's actually run by con men, con artists, scammers, and the people that are at the top, you know, the Warren Buffett types, you know, these are like the best scammers, right? They're the, they're the greatest confidence men. And that's why they're at the top of this uh, completely crooked system. Uh, and, you know, the terror is just one aspect of it. Hollywood is just one arm of it. Um, and what, but what's so funny about Hollywood is that they so often, you know, reveal what's true <laughs> in a veiled way, in a propaganda way, but oftentimes a uh, more accurate than the news. So, you know, that's, that's where we are. Uh, and it's these networks that we've been talking about that, uh, whether it's drug networks or intelligence agencies or secret societies, you know, they all kind of work in tandem. Uh, you know, look at the history of, uh, the CIA working with the mafia, for example, for uh, drug importation. Uh, you know, that's, that's documented. That's well known. It's not a conspiracy theory. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what we have with the history of uh, the ex-Cuban uh, and uh, paramilitary, you know, Bay of Pigs stuff, which I think ultimately the Bay of Pigs was like kind of a big psyop. If they really wanted to take Castro out, they could have. But setting that issue aside, you know, you, there's not really all of these rogue entities out there. Um, you know, the, the system pretty much runs the, the black markets. And, you know, anytime you see something like... Uh, uh, some big drug lord or something supposedly being busted. Well, that's just uh, whoever wasn't uh, working with the government, <laughs> right? Or it was staged to give the impression that they're making all these busts or something, or it's a low level bust, right? It's, uh, you know, the, again, the, the controlling the world it, it involves controlling black markets because that's a huge portion of the economy. I know that I, um, seen some articles spe speculating on a concern that there's a motive for a global um, police force military uh, because that way there, there would not be any concern of, uh, you know, just, just insubordination and siding with the locals, basically, you know, have no, having no attachment to the people that, that you are, um, you know, terrorizing basically in, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the event. But I mean, you, you talk about how things like Jade Helm are more for the reaction. So, I mean, I have to wonder mm -hmm. if, if these things really have any, have any real, um, you know, potential to be valid or if it's, if it's, if it's more just speculation, I don't know. How much do you see these, um, these global, um, military and police forces forming in, in the near future? Uh, well, I think we have uh, Rand Corporation documents that talk about a national police force uh, in the in the past few years, and um, I, certainly down the road, the globalists uh, would would like to see a global police force. I think that the UN Security Council this was an attempt at this. You know, after World War II, the uh, UN was created largely around the issue of the global security threat of nukes, so called. And they were, oh, we're supposed to all be just terrified of uh, nukes going off and Russia nuking us or whatever, which is, again, a mass uh, 
psychological warfare operation. It was all dreamt up at Rand Corporation. And, but they said mad men at, uh, like Herman Kahn and, you know, these people at, at Rand in the Pentagon. Uh, and that's where we can see, I think that really the, the cold war was what transitioned us into this idea of great powers operating globally for quote, quote, global security. But it's all, again, manufactured. I don't think that it's a, a real legitimate threat. I don't think that we were really going to have a nuclear war with Russia. I think that uh, the Western establishment hyped up <clears throat> the fear of Russia. And this is what Quigley says. This is what Anthony Sutton says. Uh, and ultimately, that was just so that they could put in place the infrastructure the skeletal uh, sort of backbone of what they wanted to be a global government. But I don't think they have the means or the ability to institute that yet. So a global police force would be something uh, very far down the road. Um, but to get to that state, I think you have to go through a lot of phases first. And that would include what we're watching now in the Middle East. And it would include, you know, several more decades of operations that would have to be conducted, you know, to get to that point. So that's, that's a down the road, but uh, definitely something that, that they would like to have. Absolutely. I mean, it's described in all the dystopian novels. Yes. I mean, there, there have already been accounts from certain like various regions in, in Europe and America of you know, UN troops. Right. I mean, not, not enough to cover, you know, the, you know, the entire globe and be like, you know, unified for everyone, but mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a step you know, exactly. attempting to go in that direction. It right? is, yeah. There's no question. And and yeah, this is basically just to to delocalize um, from yes. their homeland these troops so that they'll follow orders more strictly. Correct? Yeah, it's kind of the, the merc mercenary principle because you can get a mercenary to, pe to to do things to people that they don't know or care about a lot easier than you can a local cop, you know. And that's why they federalize the police forces and have been doing that for a long time now. And it was interesting because it was the beginning of federalization of local police was part of these kind of large scale terror events. Right. And the more so the more that you have these terror events, the more the, the call is had for federal grants and federalization of the, the local police. And you can look back to the uh, Patty Hearst incident, which I think was a, a, a pretty big psyop as well. Uh, that began the trend of local police having a SWAT force. And the way that that was begun, you can read about this in, uh, you know, there's actually a TV show that, that came out at the time right after the Patty Hearst thing called SWAT. And this was really popular for a couple seasons. And it popularized the idea of, oh, we need a, a SWAT team, you know, in our local police, because that didn't used to exist. And so the militarization of, of police and the federalization of local police is a big, big, big part. You're absolutely right of um, the phases, the steps, the stages, uh, you know, towards the the global government and the global police force. And then, of course, uh, there, there there does seem to be a lot of um, motivation um, for. I, I mean. Well, various forms of divide and conquer um, that is propagated upon the masses. And I mean, in America, we have a lot of these, um, you know, concerns over, well, just racial uh, tensions that get mm -hmm. fanned up. And then it turns out that that these are all like mostly non-local um, rioters in a lot of these cases, and and and, and exactly. I, I know at times, yeah, they've even traced the funding to uh, George Soros uh, for some of the incidents. So I mean, absolutely, know. yeah, yeah, you're you're spot on. Yeah, the uh, foundations and think tanks they hype up identity politics uh, as a means of uh, causing social strife and tension, and it's just another form of destabilization. Uh, it, but it, it's the same policies that are done in foreign policy, the same techniques and strategies of foreign policy uh, are done domestic <clears throat> domestically. And uh, yeah, it, it's the most basic psychological operation of divide and conquer. Absolutely right. And what's the best way to do that? Well, what things are most fundamental to humans? Things like identity, gender, uh, race, and so forth. These are the means by which you can, uh, on the one hand, uh, attempt to create social cohesion 
and demonize some enemy. So you, you, you give people the perceived enemy. So, for example, if you're a female, well, you're supposed to be a feminist and your perceived enemy that's created for you is this fictional idea of the patriarchy, which has kept you oppressed for millennia. And so you're given this story, this narrative that you believe in, which is just completely concocted and drawn up by uh, foundations and think tanks and social engineers and uh, NGOs and so forth. Right. And so absolutely. That's what that's why Soros funds all these uh, liberal uh, societies, the, these liberal NGOs in other countries, uh, for example, the open society, well, that's named after Karl Popper's book, uh, the open society. And that's all about what I was mentioning earlier of the, the, the idea of the liberal society. Well, liberalism is a weapon. It's, and I'm not talking about, uh, oh, I'm anti-war, so I'm liberal. No, that's not what I mean by liberalism. I'm talking about classical liberalism, uh, uh in, in the enlightenment sense. That is the inheritance that Karl Popper is writing his book from, and that's what Soros' society is named after, open society. And that is a, uh, it's a weaponized ideology, right? And so Arab Springs, right, this is a uh, color revolutions. All of these are techniques and strategies. They're, they've been implementing and, and trying out these things, these techniques. That's what Andrew Karibko writes about in his book that he calls hybrid war, where you uh, tie together asymmetrical warfare with mass media and color revolutions and so forth. And th these, are, these are the new techniques and strategies of regime change. Gene Sharp, the professor, wrote a whole book on this strategy, uh, you know, it, basically marketing revolution, you know, how to create your own revolution. So all, all this stuff is not real. It's not what you, th what people think it is. It's all managed. It's all controlled. It's all given to you to, think that you're being a revolutionary when whatever you're, whether you're Black Lives Matter or whether you're a feminist or whether you're a transgender or whether you're feminine or whether you're with Pussy Riot or whether you're with a color revolution, these are technologies that are created to achieve mass social change and ultimately regime change. And then, and then the amount of immigration um, into the various countries of Europe, um, it's it's been so concentrated to areas that have no ability to sustain such an amount um, when it, when it's it's really not um, a population that's really contributing as as much as just um, adding to the welfare state in a lot of in most of the cases really I mean that I don't I don't see what what the um, long term ad advantage could be other than what is it just about bringing everyone down to the same, the same level? Um, is this just like in a, in, in, a, in a financial elite sort of a plan in general? Uh, which thing in particular? Well, just the amount of immigration that we've that we've that we've seen in Europe. Um, yeah. As I, I mean, I mean, is this is this just about yeah, just just bringing everyone well, uh, down, kind of like? Soros just said, uh, "I'm investing five hundred million dollars in." immigration into Europe. Uh, Peter Sutherland, the banker, has said uh, that immigration should be used to wipe out nation states in Europe to get rid of uh, the whole idea of Europe. Wesley Clark of NATO has said that it's time for the European nation state to go. Absolutely, it's weaponized. The kudenhov kalergi plan of 100 years ago to wipe out the existing uh, European population through uh, migration, uh, it's all real. And they, like I said earlier, it's a double-edged sword because they achieve their agenda by wrecking Syria and then sending people, sending these people, these refugees uh, into Europe, uh, displacing them. And so the same thing happens with Yemen, right? These are, these are people who, in Somalia, right? These people fleeing to, to Europe and, uh, you know, Italy <laughs> sinking their boats. I mean, that's tragic, but I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you expect here? What are you supposed to do? You can't. Nation states can't handle mass influxes of people. And what all the idiot liberals think is that it's humanitarian. Uh, even the papacy has gone this route of saying, oh, it's your duty to uh, take in all of these so-called refugees. Well, of course, uh, the Vatican is not going to open up to these refugees. So that's nothing but hypocrisy on the part of these uh, liberal socialite elites uh, you know, the, the Clintons and these types, you know, who talk about open borders. Well, 
they're not going to be housing any of these refugees at their estates and mansions and houses. No, that's uh, because they're complete scumbags and they just want to wreck the population of the various countries. And that's how you create a monoculture. You, you blend and destroy and disintegrate the existing cultures to create the monoculture. And you bet it's weaponized. Totally. Yes, so this would be a motive of, of the people who are who are already at, at the uh, f- fin- top uh, financially and, and as far as their, their power and influence. Yeah, they talk about it openly. Yeah, just look up the uh, BBC statement from Peter Sutherland, the banker, who says to destroy the population through immigration. Okay, all right. So people have openly... Um, Express the link between population, depopulation agendas, and and the immigration. That, that that's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that one. Yeah, I look up the Kudenhoff Kalergi plan. That's from a hundred years ago. That's real. Uh, and uh, Soros has talked about it. Wesley Clark's talked about it. Peter Sutherland's talked about it. You know, there, there's. I'm sure you could find more statements too about it. Uh, I know. I know. I know. Bill Gates uh, speaks a lot about depopulation. I don't know. Perhaps he's contributed to some some of this immigration as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the big Gates Foundation is just another in this long list of uh, people who are on the same page. I mean, uh, you know, again, it's, it's not hard to figure this stuff out once you start to see the patterns that they all have the same agenda at work here. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, create, create a, you can't have a global society with a bunch of different cultures. And so what you have to do is smash them together uh, through these multiculturalism through these diversity projects which are actually designed to cause tension and friction clash of civilization bernard lewis the uh british strategist who geopolitical thinker who coined that term that's later used by samuel huntington they talk about clash of civilizations and so you you smash these different cultures together and that creates this sort of dissolution uh, and then you, you've got a population that's, uh, you know, easily, easily, more easily manageable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, easier to shape in, in, into whatever, whatever sort of conditioning you, you want to impose upon them. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just ultimately, um, a, lot, a lot of it just starts fi- fi- financially with, with, oppressing a, a people, but I mean, their identity as well, just so yeah, that their a, psyche is, is malleable. malleable. Uh, I think uh, shock doctrine, Naomi Klein, she's accurate when she talks about that. John Perkins talks about economic hitmen, the same strategy or model. There's a great article by uh, Greg Palace, the BBC from several years ago, the, uh, the globalizer who came in from the cold where he's uh, talking about Joseph Stiglitz, who himself is a, more or less a globalist. Uh, and Stiglitz uh, talked about the IMF plan for different countries and how they uh, cause what they call IMF riots. And then countries go into the, the, you know, spark these revolutions and then the country collapses uh, socially and that causes economic problems. And then the IMF comes in and says, oh, we'll give you, you know, $18 billion loan for your country, Ukraine, but you have to sign on to all this uh, Western garbage. And you, then you get the, gay parades, which we just now saw in Ukraine. Now suddenly there's all these uh, gay parades, which were not previously allowed in the Ukraine. Uh, now that's all good and, and holy and Western now because it's liberal. Uh, and this is what you get. And this is what you get when you sign on to the IMF. You get Coke and Pepsi and abortion and vaccines. So that's, that's the death trap. But yeah, they have to use the economic warfare and uh, you know put the country up as collateral. And then uh, later come the vultures to buy up the country uh, in their fire sale when the country's in debt and they have to, you know, sell their Greek islands to uh, pay off the debt to the IMF, which debt was all just made up anyway. Yeah, so I mean, the economic control and just the um, merging of of corporations as far as where you get all your your products. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, we have the... Uh, Monsanto and GMO food industry um, and their profits. And then, of course, the pharmaceutical industry, um, which 
this is kind of, I think, a much bit larger threat than you know heroin and and crack are because absolutely. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's the that's the and that's the real nexus of MK Ultra was that, yeah, there's a CIA and yeah, there's all these universities that participated in it. But who was making it? Well, the pharmaceutical companies were the ones making these drugs. And then when MK Ultra was supposedly shut down and it just moved to Fort Detrick and was called MK Search and it became a bio warfare program that dealt with chemicals. Well, who makes chemicals? Well, these giant pharmaceutical corporations and Dow chemical and so forth. So that's all tied in. And that's a, a large aspect of the uh, MK ultra, which is not as so much about programmed assassins as it is about the whole society being drugged. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done whole talks and lectures and articles on brave new world because Huxley told us all that in brave new world in 1932. Yes. Uh, it's fascinating how much we are seeing the statistics of, of people who are on these psychiatric medications and, and just how many negative side effects they find out after it's too late, you know, and it's been sure. dispensed for years to <laughs> large amounts of, uh, of, you know, doctors and their, and their patients. Right. Yeah. Well, the medical, the medical establishment is another arm of the whole weaponized Rockefeller created, you know, allop allopathic uh, industry uh, and, it was engineered that way. They they bought it off just like they bought everything else off. Uh, you know, for example, the uh, ecumenist movement, uh, the foundation of the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, that was all the Rockefeller funded stuff to engineer the churches. Uh, and so basically, they did the same thing with the creation of the American Medical Medical Association, uh, AIDS, Opium, and, and Empire is a good book. Uh, by Nancy Banks that, that, you know, deals with this kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, that's why you have this giant cancer industry. That's why you have this giant uh, pharma industry with uh, uh, dosing everybody on pills and it has nothing to do with nutrition and health. And that's the great irony of it is that, that that's the number one sign is that all this, uh, you know, it, it's really about uh, treating symptoms and so forth, which, you know, many people have exposed this. I'm not going to rehearse all that, but you know, if, 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 why do I see fat doctors all the time? I mean, if, if you're a doctor, presumably when common sense tell you that, you know, you would know health and nutrition, but no, that's not what it's about. Being a doctor is about going to a university where you paid a hundred thousand dollars. And the, by the way, the, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, are tied into all that and the medical, uh, schools and, the textbooks. So the, they will have a big role in what's in the textbooks. And so all these doctors are just told, you know, what, uh, what the textbooks say. I'm not saying everything in the textbook is wrong. I'm just saying that they're going to be told that the way that you treat man, uh, because man is viewed as, you know, merely a sort of biological machine, as we were talking about earlier, just a bunch of muck and goo and atoms and molecules. Well, how do you treat that? Well, you just alter the, the, the goo and you throw more chemicals at the goo to alter the goo. So that's the logic there. Of, it gets all based on a Darwinian anthropology. Well, it's only, it only works insofar as <laughs> Darwinian anthropology is true, uh, but that's why we don't see you know, advances in medicine uh, really uh, like we should is because it's all based on uh, faulty anthropology. It's, it's based on 200-year-old stuff that, that I don't believe is true. But uh, I'm not saying that, you know, there's not real medicine out there. I'm just saying that what people think hospitals and medicine is there for and what it exists to do is not what it exists for. It's ultimately part of the eugenics establishment. Uh, dysgenics is a more proper term. Uh, it's about sucking your resources out of you for these viperous corporations that run all these uh, hospitals, these, which are all incorporated. Uh, that's what it's about. It's not about health. Um, and once you understand that aspect of it, you start to see how, oh, okay. So, you know, we're, we're really under a pretty wicked system because it's, it's weaponized. Right. <laughs> it's weaponized every aspect of life. Yes. And, and, and for people who don't believe, um, it's as extreme as we describe it. Um, I, I would say, well, they should just go and do some more of the research themselves to confirm it. Uh, right. I, I, I would like to yeah thank you again for coming on, Jay. And um, 
sure. Well, if people want to um, find out more about your work, they can go to uh, a, your Jay's Analysis website, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, jaysanalysis.com, and I offer uh, talks and lectures and interviews uh, for four ninety five a month or sixty dollars a year, and those come out once a, once a week. Uh, or sometimes more than once a week. And my book you can buy is uh, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. And it's really a collection of about 25 of the best uh, essays that I've written. A lot of them were rewritten, a lot more information, about 400 pages total, 404 footnotes. And you can get that at uh, Amazon or at Trine Day Publishers. Excellent. Well, thank you for again for coming on, Jay. Um, thank you. I hope, hope to have you again. Have, have sure. a good evening. All right, thank you. It was a good talk. Thanks. Okay, everyone. Well, uh, stay tuned for Dave Robbins with Mystic Freedom. Uh, this has been Beyond the Matrix with Richard Carey. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed. We had a lot of uh, good things. And uh, I think that... Uh, of what we've discussed here, uh, we've heard well just just a lot of a lot of information. Like I said, you can just do the research to uh, to confirm for yourself. Uh, but I I I I, I do uh, want to thank you all and have a good night. Uh, as I said, do stick around for Mystic Freedom with Dave Robbins. Going to be coming on in, in just about five minutes here. And uh, we look forward to, well, you joining us next week. Uh, that's Beyond the Matrix with Richard Carey. Okay, I think we'll be... Uh, uh, Richard, don't you have a sign-off line that you like to use? Oh, yeah. I, Live long I, I, and prosper, something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a transcend the construct uh, regards. Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. Okay, that's it, man. That's it. That's my cue. Adios. All right. All right.